I want to mention a little bit more from last week. If you recall my other drawing that I was using of the circuits and me saying that in a quite real sense they could be conceived of is being divided into three parts. What seems to be a positive, a neutral, and a negative. Now all of you have heard throughout the ages up until today ideas of there being some kind of higher functions of humanity. And throughout the last several years I have attempted to pull away your attention from unprofitable ideas that in the past were couched in religious terms and would be mystical terms into a more almost scientific or at least very crude physical such as me saying that this is a fair representation of how the circuitry the very things in everyone that is in charge of perception the basis of what is commonly referred to as man's singular achievement his consciousness but there have been these stories forever about there being some kind of higher functions available or that people have in some way been touched by the gods that people have been able people periodically in history have been able to in fact love one another that there have been men or women apparently who go about and place their hands on people and make some sort of unusual energy flow to make people feel better if not cure illness at least they feel as though I have been stripped of my suffering. There have been numerous attempts to name all of these into some kind of cosmic functions, into some kind of godlike attributes. But still using this, which I drew, if you could expand, which you can, but if you could expand laterally, all of the circuits, wherein by and large we're speaking, that all of this was activated, what you would have would be in every circuit, you would have a higher functioning mode of how that circuit operates. Under such a condition, you would have the reality that other people have talked about in religious terms, as it being some kind of godlike abilities. For instance, back to the blue circuit, for instance. If you had all of this activated, wherein you were not limited to the binary functions, the way in which all the circuits are primarily structured from the red up to the yellow, of there being a kind of accepting mode that which seems to be profitable for that individual organism, and from certain viewpoints, if you can see it, it seems to be profitable for humanity as a whole, and from the larger view, that it is profitable to life. Then there is the switch that seems to repel, on the other hand, certain incoming energies, whether it seems to be information, feeling, smell, touch, everything ultimately having to be a molecular change in the system for one to be conscious of it instead of it being limited to a positive or a negative. Can you pick this up and me at the same time? Instead of it being limited to, I like this feeling. I like the way so-and-so treats me. I think I love this person. As long as you're operating on the basis of the binary mechanical structure of it, you are subject to it being turned on and off, that is, The star-crossed, passionate lovers end up with one killing the other. With a person that you believe that you love, you can. Of course, with a great deal of cause behind it, like late supper, or the wrong dress, you can apparently hate the person. When you can taste the reality of all of this being activated, you cannot 
And we're talking about now people who have done this, not that it seemed to have accidentally happened and they had some sort of so-called mystical state. When you have done this, I am telling you, you cannot revert back completely in the blue circuit, let us say, to ever being able to hate people in the way in which you have grown accustomed to hating people. Nor can you engage in what you have heretofore taken to be a positive feeling. Now, some time ago, when I would first mention about the so-called emotions, I continually would call them so-called emotions. And I would ask such questions as, don't you find it curious, or can you really accept the fact that what ordinary people call emotions, their great love of somebody in particular, or their great love for humanity, can be altered just like that after leaving the temple, the church, by a fellow church member scraping the fender of your new car. And it's not an attack on humanity. That is the way things are arranged. What is lacking, why people cannot do that, which has always been proclaimed as to be a holy duty or to be able to fulfill the kinds of feelings that prophets and would-be religious people have opened their mouth and life has spoke about this, through those men, these kind of feelings of charity, compassion, love, sympathy, you have got to have been able to see by now, operate on a most ephemeral basis that you can't really trust anybody. You can't trust yourself under ordinary conditions. You cannot trust the blue circuit to continue to love somebody. You cannot trust the red circuit or the blue circuit to even continue to like somebody. It is not your sexual partner, just a friend. Friendship can just fall apart like that. They apparently had some great deep basis. It is because things are arranged on a binary structure in one third of the circuits and everyone for all intents and purposes are is inactive it is a similar arrangement I'll try to hint to you again this week to the great threes the great three forces the great three con confluences that one always seems to be completely out of sight, whereas two of them you can see. What seems to be human feeling, two of it you can see. I know when I like something, I know when I dislike it. If all of this is activated, then every experience that that circuit has had, every experience that you have had, in this case, in emotions, has been altered. And indeed, to the same degree that you can keep this, once you have tasted it, once you have experienced it, to the same degree that you can keep it activated, then you are not subject to, I like or I dislike. And it is not a condition of not feeling, but you are not subject to it either being this or that. So therefore, any emotion toward anything, any feeling you have ever had, you are no longer captive of. You cannot go back and hate anything as passionately as you did before even should you slip back as hard as you could, if you made a conscious, willful effort to go back to being you. And I might suggest, let's jump to the red circuit, since that's an easy one to describe, or easier. <laughs> you might say that would be like learning how to swim. It might take you a week working with somebody, and you learn that you can swim across a swimming pool, and you never get back in the water then I would suggest to you that 20 years later you might fall off the edge of a dock and you would still be able to swim enough to get to shore. You might not be very good at it, but it might save your life. Under the most adverse conditions, that is, you're back plugged into the mechanical grid, you might feel a kind of hostility let us say towards someone, some idea, some group of people that you had felt in the past, but you're almost saved by the fact that you cannot feel the intensity, in this case, of a negative mode toward that person, toward this condition, as you did in the past. Because once you have felt all of this simultaneously, you have your own understanding 
that what seems to be a positive feeling towards something, what seems to be a negative feeling, is irrelevant. It had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with the apparent object of your feelings. And when you can feel them all simultaneously, you can never reinvest the same degree of your energy into the positive or the negative toward anyone, toward anything. It is like a reconstructed overview where an ordinary consciousness is always seeing things as either it is positively or negatively attuned to. But once you have activated a circuit and that you can feel, in the case of the blue circuit, you can feel what is a positive feeling, very mechanically. No explanation, no excuse, no reason for it, except genetics. You can feel simultaneously the negative, even if you'd never felt it particularly. You understand then how other people feel it, and then you feel the third simultaneously. It is indeed the reality of all mysticism. It is the reality of what people think of as being a mystical experience. It is the reality, it is closer to the reality that humans think that they are currently speaking of when they talk about love. But notice the very crude, which is about the best you can do with this, I assure you I would do better, uh, speaking of the blue circuit, instead of it being limited to I like this or I dislike this, that is not a basis that life has always been talking through man about some sort of love, about in some way that humans could feel toward one another in a way that apparently was almost impersonal. It is not possible as long as you're limited to one of the charges. It will always be personal. This feeling of everything being personal is necessary for life to grow at its large rate, at its standard tempo. Now, what all the mystics, what all the prophets have always been trying to do and what life has allowed to happen through certain people for its own benefit or else its own amusement, which I don't care to go into at this particular time, <laughs> is that all the circuits can be activated in such a way, not just the blue, I was using that from last week again. But it is true in all of the circuits. Now, all of the times that I have made passing mention, all the little rules I have made that apparently were directed right at the red circuit, like no narcotics, you know, no drugs, no alcohol. Exercise, get the body moving on a constant basis. There is a limit genetically to what can be done. That is, if you came to this and you're five foot eight, you're gonna stay five foot eight. But those correctly drawn to this, as I told you, there is already dirty work afoot or you would not have been attracted to it. No matter how pitiful you thought you are, in some cases, uh, your feeling was well justified. But regardless of that, for you to be properly attracted to this, no matter what terrible feelings you still have toward yourself every other night, you are genetically out of the ordinary. It does not mean necessarily that you're ever going to have visions and raise the dead, etc. But to be correctly drawn here, you have the ability to expand all the circuits in a lateral fashion wherein you are not limited to the binary confines in the red, the blue, or the yellow circuit. Therefore, in the red circuit, you simply will not be routinely sick like you have always been. And it's not limited to just my words of saying being sick, because until you have some freedom from it, you don't understand how it is tied into everything. It is not simply well, I have headaches a lot. 
and then trying to decide, or maybe you've already made some fragmented decision that, all right, this is caused by migraines that runs in my family. Jumping toward the other end, you might have decided somewhere along the line, based upon your own wiring, based upon your own hardware as exposure to the many software programs floating around, <laughs> which don't forget all the software programs came from hardware. You just can't recognize it yet. But based upon that, jumping to the other end, your system may have decided that the headaches are psychosomatic. It is caused by pressure. It is caused by how much my family demanded me of a child and they expected I was going to turn out to be a brain surgeon and here I am, I'm driving a cab. So I have no doubt, there's no sense me spending money on CAT scans or going to the doctor. I know my headaches, I've had them all through during high school. It is pressure, it is psychosomatic. Neither one of those alone are correct, as I pointed out to you. In fact, there is no such thing as psychosomatic illness, given the binary division that consciousness now has formulated, that in some way the head is separate, that in some way man's psyche is separate, and that it can, in some kind of closed system, it can reroute stress and make the body sick, or the body can, of course, make the mind sick, that you can get depressed from being ill, and etc. The day of their beingness of parent division, as I point out to you, is beginning to merge. It's not going to be some day that all of science or all of psychology or all of humanity is going to stand up and go, my God, I never saw it before. Now, there is no such thing as psychosomatic illness unless you found someone who had been decapitated in the head still could talk and insist that I feel <laughs> terrible. It will not happen that way because as the circuits are changing, <coughs> the whole need to explain it that way is going to become gradually moot and people will forget about it. But you're living in the midst of it changing right now. But the expansion laterally of the circuits would change sickness in you. It will change sickness. It will change moods. I'm just picking one word for each circuit and it will change ignorance. or slash, it will change what you think you know, which is the same thing as ignorance. <laughs> but you are wired up in such a way. And we're not speaking really about genetic areas. If you were born with three fingers on your hand, I'm not even going to get involved with trying to teach you how to grow a new finger if it's possible. It's more trouble than it's worth. If you were born with a deafness in one ear, just for the time being, I'm not even going to speak of that. But what you don't understand yet until it happens is your whole idea about health is erroneous. I hinted at this several years ago in several ways. When I tried several times, it didn't get anywhere much except to create laughter was fuck health. Another way I tried to describe it to you, there is no such thing as anyone healthy. But all of your feelings about being healthy, all your feelings about being sick is tied into the way in which you're wired up. Me insisting that you don't drink, me insisting that uh, there's hardly any need, any constant need in any of you for the meat of animals. Uh, for me to insist that no matter how brilliant you seem to be in your yellow circuit, no matter how much you seem to feel attuned to this, you still need to get out and pump the old thighs and the buns and run, and swim, do something. It is not some kind of test. It is not in some way to torture the old body like many of the religions continue to mouth the idea that the body must be brought into line. But the red circuit in everyone can be expanded somewhat. But the kind of expansion some of you should have already had a taste, well, many of you have, and I'll put words on it, whether you hear me or not. In the red circuit, it is not necessary by now, assuming that you have taken what I insisted were just minimum requirements, that you're out getting 30, 45 minutes worth of good active exercise every day. 
Some of you, that's nothing. Some of you were doing it already, but many of you are not wired up that way. And many of you, if they left it to the red circuit, the odds of it ever getting up and going out for a run around the block are just not even worthy of consideration. And so once you learn to do it, assuming I made you do it and I said, you got to do it and I'll throw you out and so you took it to heart and you do it. There reaches a point, not that it simply goes from, I never have liked to run. I was almost a TV potato when I was growing up. <laughs> I hated exercise. I hated people that did exercise. I used to laugh at joggers. I hated jocks back in high school. I hate the idea, but if I got to, I will. It's not that suddenly you're running and there is this moment of red circuit epiphany that one day it strikes you, oh, I love it. <laughs> but the correct expansion, it gets past that point. It gets to filling in all of this, that it gets activated, that it's not a matter because it is quite predictable. There's nothing unusual that many of you hear and that would hear this later. You're wired up in such a way, just genetically, and that is not going to change. That you're wired up in such a way that exercise is just almost a dirty word. That you're a red circuit, dividing man again arbitrarily into this. That if you're a red circuit, you actually operate by itself. You're a red circuit for the rest of its life, every time you get up to run. Every time you even think about your shoes and socks, the red circuit goes, oh no. <laughs> even after you've been doing it for years, that's just predictable. It's not a weakness on your part. It's the way you were. But notice it is not also a matter of conversion that we're all familiar with. In this case, not religious conversion. But you turn on a talk show, you pick up a book, and it's a guy that says, I smoke five packs of cigarettes a day. I drank cholesterol straight. <laughs> and then I thought I was dying, and I, and I hated exercise, and I took up running. And by God, there's nothing like it. I would cut off my arm to get all of you people out of shape to run. It's just, it's religious, and he just goes on and on, and he slobbers and frosts his mouth. <laughs> Which is, we all know, there's no need for hostility in the world except under one condition, and that's a converted anything. And it's quite proper for everyone to hate anybody that's been converted. <laughs> that was a joke. So it is not a matter. That is not what this is. It is not a matter that if you were wired up, and as far as just exercise, for, especially for no reason. You never, they look for jobs that required any exercise, that this was your red circuit toward exercise, toward the people that exercise, toward the way they talk, everything about it. It is not simply that I make you exercise or that you got scared one day and you start running enough and then one day it suddenly flips from here to there. That happens with people, which is the example I just gave. That's not it. That's nothing. The person may say, the guy who wrote this book, may say, since I started running and changed my lifestyle, boy, I feel so much better. I don't know if any of you know this, I've hinted before, but the guy's gonna die anyway. <laughs> and the idea is, the idea is that it's part of human consciousness, that all right, the man's going to live longer. If he was smoking five packs of cigarettes a day, and eating nothing but junk food and no exercise, and now he has stopped smoking. He runs eight miles a day, and his diet, he falls to a T, the recommendations of whatever the latest diet is, balanced diet. Now, everything in human consciousness will tell you, all right, he's going to live longer than he would have, but don't you bet money on that. <laughs> don't. And yet everything in consciousness says, well, he's got to. Several years ago, I asked you that question about you know, an old man that's 80 years old and he's out jogging every day. He grew up and he was a carpenter and worked 50 years and finally retired. And his son, a friend, can say, you know what? That man's still out running. He would have died when he quit laying bricks at the age of 60. If he just sat down, he would have died. Getting out there and running every day has kept him alive. Are you sure? Are you sure, for instance, it could not be backwards? <laughs> of course, we could even be backwards if anybody could see that on their own. You're getting closer 
to suspecting there is no such thing as environment, which all of consciousness tells you is not true. And it tells you if a man quits smoking and changes his diet and exercises, he's going to live longer than he would have. I repeat one more time, don't you be too sure of that. But, back to someone doing this, it is not simply that you do have this great moment of enlightenment that finally you keep going against your negative, negative, predictable feelings toward exercise and one day it just strikes you, oh, I love it. To get there is almost nothing. Don't feel like you made any kind of progress. That's nothing. It's to get to the point that your red circuit is more or less in this condition. And you can still be aware of the fact that there is nothing negative in me, nothing, and I've been doing it for years, there's nothing that ever smiles, lights up, smacks its lips when I reach for my shoes and my socks and my running shorts. It's no better, in a sense, than it was 20 years ago or two years ago when he made me start this. <laughs> All right, on that level, it's not ever going to be any better. But so what? But this level, it gets to the point that all of that is irrelevant, and you can still be aware of it. You might even make a joke about it. I'm making a joke, and some of you are already laughing. It's beyond any sense of duty. It's beyond any sense of fear that I'm going to throw you out, or it's beyond any sense of fear that you thought you were going to die if you didn't get exercise. It's beyond all of that. It is a simultaneous awareness that there is nothing in me that gives one holy damn about running. I mean, to put it mildly, that the part of me that has this thing about running or exercise, if I didn't fool with it, whatever it is that's saying this, if I in some way didn't affect this, this thing would never, you know, it'd get up and walk to the icebox, and, and it would certainly drive to the store and get something to eat, but beyond that, it has no more interest in exercise than it did 20 years ago, and that's true. But now, once you've expanded past the point of any binary limitations, it's all irrelevant. You can kind of laugh at it. But any expectation, any experience you've already had, that right, it went from me hating exercise to, boy, I'm glad he made me do it because now I love it. If indeed you were wired up not to like it and you think you now love it, you're still living in a dream because you don't. But to get to this point, it's no matter, it's no longer a matter of, well, I didn't like it and I still don't. It's a matter of, which really doesn't tell you anything. It's a matter of, so what? It's a matter of a complete view, an overview, of being able to see that which man is not situated ordinarily to see. It is a way in which, let's move up to yellow circuit or try, conceive of all three circuits, if you had something resembling this. Primarily the way in which you, whatever that is, it seems to be an individual consciousness, that seems to be you and this body. And it seems to be me and these feelings that overtake me. And then it seems to be me, when it gets closer up here, as you should know by now, it's not quite as easy with consciousness at the ordinary level to feel any great distinction between the thing saying me and then the yellow circuit because that seems to be the seat but it is much easier for this thing to apparently talk about me and my body as I point out to you and as all of you should know by now you constantly do it you do it the internal voices do it you don't have to speak overtly that it's constantly talking about you and the body and like it's some kind of appendage or some kind of possession and then you and feelings, like, well, feelings are something that happened to me. By and large, feelings are no good. That is, when I think of feelings, I think about being depressed, I think about being hurt, I feel about being disappointed. And where's the source of it? Not I, the source is out there. The feelings are something that kind of happens to me, people do it to you. So that in some way, this thing that's talking still feels as though I'm separate from feelings. If all three of the circuits, to some degree, had the experience of this, then the kinds of things, some of the terms I've used in the past about omnidirectional consciousness, multifaceted consciousness, you would then have a kind of reality to it. 
you would then have a kind of living reality to what everybody else has been talking about as being kind of mystical states. It is a kind of unnatural balance. It is, from one view, if you can see this very quickly, when I say it's unnatural, it is not just to bring about an impression of there being a kind of unnatural inside negative connotation to this, but you should be able to see that all of humanity could not be in this condition like this now, and things continue as they are. That I do not exaggerate when I say if that happened, you know, everything would stop. Yeah, it might take 30 minutes. But you've got to see that all conflicting opinions, all conflicting feelings, all the people that seem to physically make things happen on this planet, and all those that sit back and think, God, thank God I'm not a bricklayer. Thank God I'm not that crude. Thank God I don't have to live in a trailer and live in Alabama or in New Jersey or Tarzana that it were it not for these conflicting, based upon that binary, if everyone is this condition, we would have, I guess, the ultimate Southern California. The whole world would terminally, <laughs> would terminally mellow out within 20 or 30 minutes. You could almost see it as it being a kind of condition of a distinguished non-compliance. that under this condition, someone would not be complying with life's general appearances and life, and it would not be complying with the notion of an outcome. If you had, in general, all three circuits expanded to the point that this was a reality to you, it was not me talking, it was not me drawing circles with three lines through it and symbols in the three sectors, there would be a kind, individually to you, there would be a kind of distinguished non-compliance that would not be acceptable on a large level. It would interfere with life's growth. It would create a complete, unacceptable imbalance. But you would not be personally any longer complying with life's appearances. You would not be complying with the kind of energies that you were wired up to take in, to regenerate, and to transmit. You would not be given over to the total hands of the Philistines within you, whether it be red, blue, or yellow circuit, that anything that struck you that needed to be done, or that you simply wanted to do that seemed to be the red circuit, and everything in you from the red circuit on up that seemed to be your background said, you can't do that. You shouldn't try to do that. You're not equipped to do that. You'll look silly doing that. Plus, who needs that? We're too intelligent to learn how to water ski. I don't need to learn how to swim. That's for bimbos. I'm a thinker. It all becomes a kind of non-compliance. Did you understand all of that? Yes, I hear all the voices. I know all the feelings, and it's just irrelevant. You could do it. You could do it as much as your genes would allow you to do it. It's not a question of whether you became a world champion water skier or swimmer. But it is a matter that you are not limited to the binary charges of any of the circuits of it saying you can't do that. If we're assuming if you know, you're a quadriplegic, let's assume you couldn't swim. Within the limits of the way one is wired up, the captivity of one's genes, there is a freedom that is not a matter of growing arms and legs or fingers or making you taller, but it is a matter that there is a one-third area within all of everyone's circuits that is untouched. It is where tomorrow comes from. It is the area in which the other two play. It is the background in which everything, all the charges, restate their position, swap positions. It is the dance floor. It is, as I've tried to suggest to you, perhaps the reality I suggested of what E would be. It is the irrelevant. It is that which apparently has nothing to do with the positive and negative at that time. But it is the one area within everyone 
and within the three circuits as I have arbitrarily named and drawn them for you, that if it is activated, you then have the ability not to comply with what's going on and that which seems to be limits, notwithstanding the genetic captivity of all of us, but that which seems to be limits. I cannot get over my temper. I cannot get over my continual lapsing into feelings of being disappointed in my fellow man. I can't get over worrying about death. I can't get over worrying about I've wasted my life. I can't get over thinking everybody else in the world is more intelligent than me. When you taste this kind of lateral expansion, you'll also understand. One time I tried to point out to you that someone that could expand the circuits like this, there is no way in which to judge them because there is no hero left, or there are no heroes. It does not matter, again, based upon the limits of genetics, whether one can become a world-class water skier. It does not matter whether one becomes a renowned artist or musician, and it does not matter that one never receives their PhD in physics. When this happens, there is no one in the world smarter than you, and you won't know it until it happens. There are people that know things you don't know, but that'll always be true. There'll be people who can physically we take this to the red circuit that can do things you can't do. That'll always be true. You can't live long enough to learn how to do them. There will be people that apparently down the blue circuit that apparently seems to have something to do with creative activities. And I'll leave it at that for the time being. That's the way it appears to people. There are limits to all of it. There are limits time-wise. There are limits interest-wise. There are limits genetically. But on this basis, I'm telling you quite correctly, there is no one in the world smarter than you are, and you'll know it at that time. There are people that know things you don't know. There are people in here that know things I don't know. There are people sitting next to you that know things you don't know. But there is no one then any smarter than you are. You're smarter than everyone else because you can see all of this at one time. You can see everything. All right, I went this far. You can see everything you know and everything you don't know, and you can see everything that everybody else knows, and you can see everything that they don't know, and then you can see the background upon which all this moves, and then you can see, dare I say it, then you can see the personal importance thereof. It's not to discount education, it's not to discount intellectual curiosity, but this, at any level of humanity, any ordinary level, that is the supreme intelligence. And it might not appear to be, because the person does not necessarily display any kind of manifestation. They're not necessarily a walking, living encyclopedia of witty sayings. They're not necessarily a living monument to creativity. And if you saw them running, they may be huffing and puffing and biting their lip and if you look in their eyes, they may be cursing. Not with any great passion, but just fuck all this. But it doesn't matter, you have to do it. Once you know what you gotta do, you gotta do it, and it's just irrelevant. And down the circuits, what says, well, I don't wanna do this, and what says, oh, it'd be good for us, or we should do it. It's just meaningless. It goes on, but that is not why you do it. Why you do it is, is you don't have any choice. Because once you have seen it from this kind of overview, there is no choice. Certainly you can go back to drinking. Certainly you can go back, as the Protestants call it, I think, backsliding. You can try your best to slip back into it. But once you see it, you can never regain the passion of it. You can never take it as being your word anymore. You can never take it as, well, listen, exercise has nothing to do with one's personal ability. It has nothing to do with one's intelligence, and I don't care what anybody says. I've always felt that way, and I still feel that way. Once you see it, that's no longer true. You're aware of the fact that, yes, once, that seemed to speak to me as far as red circuit activity. But now I can see this, but now I can also see all of this 
So anything can be said, anything that a natural voice for me or anybody else would point out, it's Looney Tunes time. It's just meaningless, as much as any other words, any other descriptions. You simply have no choice. I want to repeat to you again, I've left it for a while, is everything that goes on, including this, but everything that goes on has no basis in reality on the descriptions that this is intellectual, this is red circuit activity, this is psychological, and yet this, someone holding me, somebody patting me on the back, this is certainly good physical, tactile, relationships and then emotions or something else. There is a spiritual life somewhere hidden in all this. There is no such thing. There is molecular activity. It doesn't matter whether someone is praising you. It doesn't matter whether someone is patting you on the back and saying, there, there. It doesn't matter if somebody is operating on you with a scalpel. It doesn't matter if someone says, listen, I've got the secret of life and here it is. All of that is out there while remembering there is no out there, but it is out there until it creates molecular alteration of some kind in you, right then, or through memory. But whatever seems to be happening then, and you seem to be hearing it, you seem to be feeling it, you can call it whatever you want to. Life still has humanity calling it emotions, feelings, thought. I'm having to deal with it. I sit here and talk about it. But remember, I spent a little bit of time there, and almost all of you got a glimpse of it. But notice how it went away, and I hadn't mentioned it now in some months. It does not matter what seems to happen out here. It does not seem to, no matter what happens in the grid, no matter what seems to be the source of energy, of irritation, of information, that somewhere out here, the environment is affecting me. There's things out here, words, feelings, potential, it all comes down to one thing and one thing only, that in some way you take it in through your senses, the way in which you are plugged into the grid, and it creates molecular activity in the senses. Then there is this verbally proclaimed, and it is indeed an illusion in the fact that it is not a full representation of what happens, that these things are other than they are. And it's light waves, it's sound waves, it's touch turned into internal molecular activity. And in the end of your processing unit, which right now in us is right up as far as the line level of consciousness goes in the brain, it then takes it as being something personal. I am thinking. I am considering what you said. I am disagreeing with that. I am upset that someone would speak like that. I am hurt. I am cold. But there is a big difference between being cold and being hurt. There is a big difference between feeling the call of the gods to do something great and to have a paper cut on my finger. There is no exception to it all being molecular activity. But what if, even though very few of you right now, because I can feel the molecular activity in my great mystical way, very few of you can hold on to that just for a few seconds, even those of you right now that feel as though I have seen that clearly at one time. And at that moment I saw it, I felt like I had been released from prison. I felt like I was about to explode and I kind of had to calm down. That's, that's pretty strong. Or something happened. I don't know. I just can't bring it back. And even as I sit here now, very few of you can hold on to that for any length of time, which, as always, you should learn from that, that you get some glimpse that that's true. No matter how you cut it, no matter what you say about it, no matter, maybe it doesn't have the ramifications that he seems to be insinuating but in a sense, at a very crude level at least, by God that's true, and yet I can't remember it. I'm not equipped to remember it. 
There is nothing in me, even when I hear it and I feel as though I've had a true glimpse of it. I cannot walk around with this feeling when people say, hey, did you get that report ready yet? Are you late again? God damn, you're putting on weight. Listen, dear, I don't think I love you anymore. I'm going to run away with the Alberta hockey team. That all of this is something that is happening. It is something that is personally happening to my life. It is affecting my brain, my mind. It's affecting my personality. It's affecting my feeling. Plus, I'm a bit chilly, which is a different matter altogether. <laughs> but what one should find, at least for the time being, to carry you away is, is to realize the fact that you are structured, all of you, everybody on this planet, in such a way as this kind of information. You can hear it. You can get a personal glimpse that that is true. And it's like trying to hold on to smoke. There is nothing in you. There is no hardwired structure. There are no functions. There are no facilities in the human organism to hold on to that information over any length of time. It just comes and it goes. And sometimes it goes and you go back and try to look at it and it didn't make sense anymore. It was clear as a bell two weeks ago, five minutes ago. And right now, I can repeat the words. I even wrote myself a note here. I mean, it struck me sort of in a particular personal way that I even saw more, I think, than he mentioned at that time. And I wrote it down. And I read it now, and it's gibberish. <clears throat> if everyone could be made to hold on to that sermon, that it's all molecular, it's all molecular, it's all molecular, and then it's all molecular. If suddenly everyone had an awareness of that, again, on your own without me going into dramatics, surely you get some feel as to how that would affect everything. That all of that which I am, that me and everyone else takes personally, you know, such as my feelings being hurt and plus being a little chilly tonight, that it all comes down to the same thing. Life would not be growing. Humanity would not be growing. Humanity could not sustain the level at which it even has been operating for the last several thousand years if that happened. It is a variation. Or at least the way I'm describing it to you, I can point out is a variation of one aspect of the master stroke that in a sense I can say that people are sorely, sorely, sorely limited to any degree of freedom of action, thought, and feel. And yet everyone believes otherwise and goes on operating as though the latter were true. When it's not, but then a surprising thing happens. The way in which humanity operates, you cannot logically then go back and prove that they're not true, that they're not free, because there wouldn't, if they weren't free, we couldn't have changed like this. Yeah, but wait a minute, wait. It's just that they believe they are, and so they keep trying to do it. It gives a whole new definition to the term irrational, that it can't be true. The wrap up for tonight. This one should either be very low keyed or it should be bombastic. Since I don't have either planned, I guess we'll go for the middle ground. After all the time I've spent and all the efforts I've made, in a sense, to disavow you people of past dreams before you got here of mysticism. This is the ultimate mysticism. Except what we have done, what I have done, has been stands any of the trappings of ordinary mysticism. I have gone to extremes in the other direction. You're going to find it out on your own, but I might as well point out again, part of this is connected to whatever I have to start doing publicly, 
this could not be presented in a manner that very much resembles what I have been doing. And I can give several descriptions which I've brushed against in the past that it seems too clear cut, it seems too dispassionate, it seems as though it is anti-mystical, it seems as though it's not even promising anything very much out of the ordinary except me describing how you can create internal molecular changes in yourself that almost or seem to belie any notion of a spiritual life or any kind of greater perception. But this is mysticism. But the way it's always worked in the past, and by mystical I mean religious and all forms of it. And you've had enough experience from your own reading and from contemporary times that mysticism normally, whoever seems to be in charge of it, an organization seems to spring up around somebody's teaching or some line of teaching, and then somebody's in charge. As things are arranged, not by the course of the participants, they're just the molecular changes that life is undergoing itself, but it's arranged in such a way as to keep them from the danger of a close confrontation. And part of it is the trappings of it, part of it is the costumes, the rituals, the ceremony, the inside jargon, the belief that the information is directly coming from the gods, that is coming from something outside the system, coming from the creator of the system, but coming from something outside the system. But this is the mysticism everybody dreams of. I have just stripped it down to almost, I don't guess Barry Essentials covers it. I have stripped it nude. I have shown its backside to you, whether you saw it or not. But it cannot move out in the public on that basis. Part of the activities that I have had you people involved with in the past of these kind of public programs over the last several years that periodically I'd let you put on, have you put on, and I didn't really involve myself. I didn't give commentaries or critiques. I gave no restrictions. I turned it over to you. And much of it, to say the least, as you should be aware and should have expected, was kind of a warmed over me. At least you didn't do anything without any great analyzation. You didn't do anything that if I walked in, I'd holler, oh my God, no. It all, you just, everybody just had the feel that even if this wasn't great, if he walks in, at least he can't say, oh, shame, shame. Or, or me go, yeah. And we say, no, absolutely not. That at the very least, it was just like me kind of warmed over that at least I could not really find anything to vehemently object to. I could say, hey, it's dull. I could say it's repetitious. But I couldn't really come in and say, hey, you, did you write this? Are you in charge of this one production? Out. That, you know, you're nuts. <laughs> but within what you people did, I also noticed nobody showed the least inclination. It didn't come out is all I'm concerned about now. They didn't show the least overt inclination to try and present something that seemed to be mystical. On the contrary, many of you people made a point through the introductions to the programs or through your own skits or whatever you, the way in which you were conveying your part of the program was to try and present to the interested people that might show up that, hey, now this is not all, it's not spooky, this is not some kind of cult here. It's kind of an intellectual expansion of one's horizons. You might be able to feel things you never felt. You know, give it a chance. Just sit down, be reasonable, be calm. Nobody's going to attack you. We're not going to take your name and send you solicitations for money. But do note, the, uh, just based upon common, ordinary standards, the kind of success you had. Not that the people did not enjoy it that showed up, but you did not suddenly create a whole new tribe of Israel beating down the door, thinking they had found the lost teaching. You did not suddenly have Christians showing up and hollering, I see the light, I see the light. You didn't have people rushing in and saying, I've been following such and such teaching, and now I realize, ha, ah, this is the heart of it. One other way, I don't to 
give you any more dreams, but that you might look at how mystical this is, is how you inexplicably ended up here. Of course, it's not as your fellow humans have wanted to believe that the gods outside the system in some way selected you individually. Some of you have tasted enough in other areas that you're way past that. But it's still strange. If you want to talk about real mysticism, is what in the fuck are you doing here? How did you end up here? And any stories that you may have had in the past, you must by now, if not having a clear sight of how they came about, you should at least smell the aroma of two-week-old fishnets. There is no explanation that your system can come up with. Doesn't matter that at the age of five your mother took you to see Swami so-and-so, or that you grew up in a household reading mystical books, or that you're all of your family have been rabbis. None of that matters. It is inexplicable how you ended up here. It is not a personal matter. It is not that gods have selected you. It's not that I in some way, surely not if you believe this, that I selected you. You ending up here, you're surprised by it as I am. I mean individually. You know, your feeling it was a miracle you ran across one of my books, and it was a miracle that one day you decided to write me a line, and it was a miracle that you just couldn't believe it. I wrote you back a line, and then you ended up here. You know, anything that you personally got selected, surely you're beyond that. It's not necessarily that you have any answer to supplant that one. But you are not selected in some way by something outside this system, nor are you selected by me. But if you want to look at mysticism in a real sense, the inexplicable is the inexplicable reality that you ended up here. Out of all I have done to make this seem to be in some ways in conflict to your past dreams, your prior dreams, I just want to remind you again that this is ultimate mysticism. And all of us dressing up ordinary and all of us having ordinary occupations, all of us being apparently ordinary boys and girls, and having ordinary get-togethers, fairly ordinary meetings, and we all have rather ordinary haircuts, and <laughs> sort of ordinary clothes. Our terminology is fairly ordinary. This is the ultimate mysticism. It's not at all what it appears to be on the surface. It's not at all what I present to be. I just made it all this up. It's not at all what you think the group is here for. The people around you are not at all what you think they are. Now, is that mysticism or not? <laughs> Two tasks. One is I want a response from everybody, a written response of some kind to this question. I want to hand it in next week. Speaking on the ordinary level, when I say creative people, what ordinary life and tells you that they are. What's up that those that apparently are creative people in the arts of all kinds, in life, are predominantly pessimistic? <laughs> I want some kind of response from everybody. Uh, my trimming way of fat, by the way, I didn't do everybody at once this week. I'm going to let this be a continuing thing as we'll drop some pounds periodically, if not weekly. I want a response to this question. If those that apparently are creative, just in the ordinary sense out in life, the artists, the writers, 
musicians, painters. That which life calls, I'm not arguing with that, you all know what I'm talking about. That which life calls the creative fields, creative people. Why? And predominantly, my use of that is charitable. Are they pessimistic? What is up? How can you make that fit? What can life be up to? Second task, I want you to do something. Out, out of everything you have been exposed to, based upon we're taking my words right now, and then your understanding to whatever degree that struck you, that seemed important, what I want you to do is imagine that we were going to come up with our own Ten Commandments. I want you to also come up from everything I've said, and whatever struck you, is what would be a suitable list of Ten Commandments for this? It can be either thou shalt or thou shalt not, which I could point out is a, another one of those great, all endearing, all enduring ways in which humanity divides itself up into two, count them, one, two, count that some will write the Ten Commandments of Thou Shall. Damn few, I would suspect, unless I hadn't mentioned this, and then the other group would be Thou Shalt Not. <laughs> thou Shalt Not Be Sad. And then somebody here and there might say Thou Shalt Smile. Thou Shalt Be Happy. I am going to have to come up with a fairly simplistic, newly guised way in which to move this publicly. And it is going to be in a sense, it's got to be religious, whether I call it that. I'm not, it's not important that we call it religious, but it has got to have the appearance of it. And that's one reason I was reminding you again tonight I certainly have pushed it far enough that it stretches ordinary conceptions of validity for me to say that this is mysticism, or therefore inferring that I'm in some way mystical. I think I have done my job, I think I've done a darn good job of disavowing you people of, or, of ordinary connotations of that but if you let it stop right there, or if I let it stop, I got news for you, you have been fooled. God, have you people been suckers. That was kind of a joke. It just shows what a good job I did. <laughs> to get into really being fooled, you'd be able to, for any length of time, to forget that everything that happens, everything that you think that you have experienced, everything that you think you know, everything that you think you have felt, has been limited to, based upon, caused by nothing but molecular activity. And up until now, it has been based upon a binary structuring of the five senses. Every great thought you had, every great feeling you had, every high point of your emotional life, every low point has been, I'm a bit chilled. It's a little too stuffy in here for me. If it's not molecular activity, it does not exist. How would you suggest that you put that in a mystical garb and slip that upon the heretofore unsuspecting public? Everyone, cut it. <laughs>